tour of United States Vice President Wallace through seven cheering Latin American republics is a significant triumph for the good neighbor policy of the Western Hemisphere. Welcomed by enthusiastic throngs wherever he appeared, Mr. Wallace is hailed as a man of the people. The day the vice president arrived in Bolivia, that country declared war upon the Axis. Drives through the streets of La Paz, friendly crowds swarm about his car. This, they say, is the Yankee farmer who speaks our language, our good neighbor from the north who comes to cement the ties of lasting friendship. Ending his five-week tour, Mr. Wallace pays his respects to Bolivia's President Penaranda. Planes over Monterrey, Mexico, herald President Roosevelt's historic visit with President Camacho. The first ladies of the two nations meet, as for the first time in 34 years, a United States president stands upon Mexican soil. Not until six hours before his arrival did Monterrey know of Mr. Roosevelt's coming. Immediately, the streets were bedecked in his honor. Young cadets salute the distinguished visitor as units of Mexico's regular army pass in review. A significant and impressive display of America's allies. Greek battalion of volunteers training to fight the Axis typifies the spirit of free people throughout the world. French foreign legionnaires embarking for Tunisia. Already with strong units of fighting French, they're moving up with the British 8th Army in the drive to crush Rommel. One by one, the armies of a people who will never bow to the Axis yoke are reforming to march with the United Nations. Day after day, from Britain, from Canada, from America, fresh contingents of combat troops are pouring into North Africa. Docks loaded with enormous supplies, equipment, assembly lines spring up in the open. Trucks, motors, parts, moving into place with all the efficiency of a modern factory. In a sector on the Tunisian front, fleets of mighty tanks advance across the open plain. Allied tanks and allied guns moving up for the final show. Today, over roads of mud and mire, the armies of the United Nations are on the march. The United States aircraft carrier Hornet, part of a task force steaming into Japanese waters, is now revealed as the secret base from which American planes first bombed Tokyo. Here is that secret airfield. 16 B-25s, twin-motored army bombers, lashed to the Hornet's flight deck. The dramatic saga of a combined Army-Navy mission that brought panic to Japan and stirred the world for its brilliance and daring. Colonel Doolittle, now a major general, assembles his 80 volunteers before the flight. 
Not until this moment is their objective revealed. The heart of the island empire. A fitting touch. Japanese medals awarded United States officers for humanitarian aid to the Japanese people are returned attached to 500 pound bonds. Now in heavy seas, some 800 miles off Japan, enemy patrol boats are sighted and sunk. Survivors are picked up and put aboard a cruiser. Fearing they have radioed Tokyo a warning, Doolittle decided to take off 10 hours ahead of schedule. Plans are changed on an hour's notice. Motors begin to warm up. Never before have big loaded bombers been launched in such numbers from a carrier at sea. For months they've trained secretly. Now for the test. Doolittle's plane is first down the runway. The commander leading the flight. As the carrier plows through heavy seas, one bomber after another soars from the flight deck, pointed for Japan. Rougher, the weather worse, but not one plane fails to get into the air. Taking the gale in its teeth, each bomber sets its course for carefully prearranged military objectives in Japan. A course that will put them over Tokyo at high noon in broad daylight. The Yokosuka Naval Base ablaze. Arms plants, rail yards, and oil refineries smashed by the raiders in Tokyo, Yokohama, Kobe, and Osaka. Then journeys end for the great adventure. Fuel gone, 15 of the planes are wrecked as their crews are forced to bail out over China and Japanese-occupied territory. The Japanese government flatly admits that of eight uniformed flyers captured, some have been executed. This in flagrant violation of all international law. 64 of the 80 men who took off were rescued, and most of them have returned to duty. In Chongqing, Madame Chiang Kai-shek honored Doolittle and his gallant men for a raid that did much to shake the complacency of the Japanese warlords.